Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Sashwita Gupta, your ACCA mentor. And this session was supposed to be a live session on YouTube, but there were some technical glitches uh, yesterday. And I hope like 126 people were already there in the session. And still we had to call that off because of this impaired mic anyway. So I just got it uh, repaired. At the end moment, it gave us, you know, uh, it was not working fine. So anyways, Let's get started with our grand revision of September 2024 for advanced audit and assurance. So it's better that I'm recording this video because then I will have the momentum as well. And in communication to you also, you can also pause it. Sometimes you don't understand something, you can pause it, rewatch it, and you know, you can take your running notes as well. Anyways, I would also provide you the notes in the description of this video. You'll already find the notes, so just download them first. And then listen to this video. If possible, get them printed, keep it in front of you and then listen to what I'm saying. And keep on taking those handwritten notes as in when I go forward in this session. So without any further ado, let's get started with today's class. And let's discuss everything about advanced audit and assurance for September 2024. So first of all, guys, I would like to discuss the format of your paper. That is very important because many students, you know, they fail this paper. Let me be very honest and brutal with you that there are so many students who fail their paper at 49 marks. If you are one of them, first of all, accept it. Okay. I'm sure by now, by far, you've already accepted it. That's why you're preparing it for again. First of all, understand that this is not your mistake. You know, I've seen many people and tutors who would say that, you know, you were not able to pass this paper. That's your fault. No. Advanced audit and assurance is such an exam that even someone who's super intelligent, it's a possibility, very much a possibility that they might flunk at 49, 48, 47. Even if you have good common sense, you have good commercial acumen, you've, you've been good in advanced audit, uh, sorry, in audit and assurance F8 paper, whatever might be the situation, there is still a possibility to flunk in this paper because of the nature of this exam. Why? First of all, look at the format. We have question one, okay, question two, and question three. These are the three questions in the paper. In question number one, we have a 50 marker question, which actually involves uh, audit risk questions, ROMM questions, and business risk questions. And it might also have other factors as well, including your uh, like evidence procedures, direct theory questions. Now, why we fail this paper? Like, why the pass percentage is so low, like up to 30, 31. Why? The first reason is, guys, that we are not able to manage time. Now, if you ask me syllabus, I would say in the whole curriculum of ACCA, AAA or Audit and Assurance are such papers whose syllabus is very easy. Like it's theory, you know, there's no calculation, no formula, nothing to be remembered. Uh, like in SBR, we still have standards to remember. Here, we even don't have those things. So it is so easy, like, you know, it's commonsensical also. It's just that we have to memorize certain keywords. So syllabus is very easy. Why are we not able to pass this paper? Is first reason is time management. Now, I will teach you how you can actually manage your time. So first of all, your time management skill is 1.8 minutes per mark. So that means I need to spend, I need to spend half of my time in question number one, which would come around to be 1.5 hours in the paper. So that needs to be spent on question number one. So that means I can spend around 90 minutes on my question number one, approximately, if I keep 15 minutes aloof for the reading time. So three or 15 minutes, you can give the extra 15 minutes also to question number one, where you actually read it because there is a lot of complexity in question number one due to the volume of the case study. And the remaining time to type it out, you can take 90 minutes. Now, in those 90 minutes, it might feel that, you know, 90 minutes is a huge number of uh, minutes that we are getting for this uh, particular uh, question, unlike other papers like SBR. So still people are not able to complete this because of the volume. You know, in the one requirement, in one case study only, they will ask you multiple things. For example, they will ask you business risk, 
they will ask you ROMM, risk of material misstatement. They will ask you evidence. They would ask you procedures or they would ask you direct theory question. I'm going to deal with direct theory questions today. But anyway, they would ask you so many things which will become really difficult for you to understand. That might become really, uh, you know, time pressuring on you that I'm reading a case study. It's like I'm reading a whole essay. And from that one essay, I have to figure out 10 different things. So while reading one paragraph, I have to keep 10 different lenses. How difficult is that? You know, it's in other way, I would like to uh, just, you know, portray it. Like, usually, you know, I take the example of my mom. She is sometimes uh, acting as my friend. Sometimes she's asking, you know, uh, treating me as a doctor. And uh, sometimes she's my, you know, uh, teacher also. So it's like she's playing different roles. And still the kid is the same, right? So same you have to do. While reading the same paragraph, you have to be following different lenses. You have to look at the same thing with different perspectives. When you look at it from the perspective of business risk, you are applying SBL knowledge. When you look at it from the perspective of ROMM, you are applying SBR knowledge. When we are talking about evidence, that is common sense, or you can say it is double A knowledge. When we are talking about direct theory question, you are applying your rectification knowledge. Rectification needs cramming knowledge. Yes. So that is something which becomes difficult. And then to make it more difficult, they add numbers to it. They would ask you to do analytical procedures, to comment on what are the risks, but also give detailed analysis. Now, they are not contended with just a one point for one mark, unlike SBR. So in SBR, how easy and simple it was now that I was writing just one point and getting one mark. Here it is not like that. Because there are 20 professional marks. 20 freaking professional marks. Who is going to give you this? The person who is checking your paper. You need to impress that guy or ma'am, whoever is that. You need to impress that person. Now you can't do something which is like face to face, you don't know the person, so you have to impress him or her via your paper, via your knowledge, so that you get these professional marks. Now, how can I impress the invigilator, the examiner? How could I do that? So for this, what you have to do is, you have to basically think about what he has or she has written in the requirement. So what is there in my requirement? I need to look at that. What is there in the requirement? Like, are they asking me something about ROMM? So I'll be specific to ROMM. If they're asking me something about audit procedures, I'll be specific to audit procedures. I should know how to write audit procedures. If I would do silly mistakes, like intermingling the evidence with procedures, then who? You offended the examiner. And that is the person who's supposed to give you 20 professional marks who can decide whether you fail or whether you pass. So please avoid basic mistakes. Avoid basic silly mistakes. Keep your exam technique top notch. Okay, that's first thing. Exam technique. You know, you might be getting 49, but that guy can save you by giving you a plus one from the professional marks. How important it is to actually impress the examiner with your exam technique. Maybe the knowledge is lacking. Maybe the answers are not, you know, up to the mark. Maybe the conclusion is wrong. But exam technique, professional marks, technical, you might be wrong, but your technique should be right. It's just like your answer of a numerical might, or, might be coming out wrong, but the way of calculation should be right. So this is very important from the perspective of triple A paper. And coming back to another reason why people fail is first of all, time management. As I said, for that, you need to practice a lot. So I hope you uh, all have written a mock by far. Okay. So my students at TG Professionals have already written one mock. And second mock that they're going to write is the mock from ACCA the uh, AAA pre-mock from ACCA for the September attempt. You guys can also try that because ACCA also debriefs it and I would also debrief it on my YouTube channel. So that is very important. Now, I would also suggest if you have time after Super 20 questions, which I gave from ACCA Study Hub, you can even try last two years past papers. If you want to, if time allows, 
write them in time pressured environment that is how you would learn about time management okay so this is what our first question looks like and this is the reason why people fail and what is the knowledge to be applied in the first question now come to question number one so question number two question number two comes from various areas like for example it is from matters to be considered the type of requirement is matters to be considered now what is matters to be considered here we talk about that in the uh, case study there would be something wrong which is done by the accountant okay uh, some wrong accounting treatment which is being done and as an auditor you're supposed to identify okay that what is the wrong accounting treatment and you're supposed to mention that dude this is wrong and when you say something is wrong you're supposed to give a reason like why is it wrong and then you're supposed to mention what is the right thing so for that you need your SBR knowledge again because you're supposed to mention whether the accounting treatment is right or not. So how to answer are matters to be considered requirement? How to answer are matters to be considered requirement? So first I'll talk about the materiality of that matter. Okay. To the financial statements. So you all know the threshold of materiality. Comment down what is the threshold of materiality for revenue for PBT. Uh, we might use PBT or operating profit based upon the case study. And what is free materiality level for total assets? Comment down. So I'll first mention the materiality. Second, I'll talk about the treatment. What is the accounting treatment as per the IFRSS? And lastly, I'll talk about how does it impact? It can impact two things financial statement and it can impact the audit report correct so if the audit is in the process like you've completed the audit and you're in the reporting phase then you will tell the effect on report if you're in the planning stage only and then you're considering any matter then you will talk about its impact on the financial statements this is overstated this is understated uh, about report you can tell what would be the impact on the audit opinion uh, whether the report will be modified or not that's how you write it. And what about treatment? What are we going to write in treatment? You will write about IFRSs. So, for example, there is something related to sale and lease back in the case study. Maybe they would have done something in a wrong way. So, obviously, when they give you such a requirement, they would have done it in a wrong way only. So, don't become doctors of IFRSs and say, no, they are right only. They are wrong. That's why this is there in your paper. So now calculate the materiality, state the treatment, state what is the impact on the financial statement because of this misstatement. And if it is a, a you know audit in the reporting phase, then also tell what is the impact on the audit report. Right. So this is what we have to do in our first uh, two questions. Now with matters to consider, they can pair this requirement with evidence or procedures. So evidence is widely tested, but they don't, don't underestimate procedures as well. Now, what are procedures? What are evidences? I've been telling this time and again, and this is the silliest mistake which many intelligent people even do. They intermingle these and then they lose their easy peasy marks. So first of all, you should know that evidence is a document. Evidence is a document. So when I say as an auditor, what do you have as an evidence for IS-16's correct accounting treatment? So you concluded that the accounting treatment of property, plant and equipment by the accountant is correct. Now, if you're saying this, there must be some base to it. Why are you saying it is correct? So you are supposed to give proper reasons to it. Why is it correct? For that, you need to perform procedures on that particular item or account balance. So on PP, you're supposed to perform some work as an auditor. Now that work can be in the field of like you go and physically inspect the uh, property, plant and equipment or you do the recalculation of its depreciation, whatever you do. So work that you perform is procedure. It's a verb. It's a work. So if I say recalculate, it's a verb. It's a work. So that is a procedure. Now after performing this work, you must have collected a sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Where do you collect it? You keep it in your working papers. Okay, so as an auditor, you're supposed to maintain a file which is known as working paper. And that is very important because if you don't keep that file, that is what we say, that we have to do enhanced record keeping. In money laundering, we say this. 
you know, to limit our liability as an auditor, we are supposed to keep records with us. So you're supposed to keep the working papers with you. You are supposed to keep any information that you received from the client with you. So that in future, if that client is sued or you are sued because of the client, you have proofs with you. Any emails that you've exchanged, any formal communication that you've had, any working papers that you have related to that client, you are supposed to keep that, store that. That is like very, very important. So this document that you receive or keep as in your working papers is what I call as evidence. So I'll give you a very simple and quick example of procedure and evidence. How to write a good procedure? Let's talk about procedure on property, plant and equipment. Okay. So I need to check for property, plant and equipment. It's an ACID. So for ACIDs, I need to check its revac. What is revac? It's an assertion. Uh, acronym for the assertion. Assertion is promises made by the management. So management has made a promise that PPE, there are rights and obligations because it's an ACID. So there exists rights and obligations. Okay. And second assertion that they've given me is that it exists. It is physically present. Its existence is also an assertion. Its valuation is also an assertion. Its accuracy by which we have recorded it in the financial statement is also an assertion. Then lastly, its classification is also an assertion. So for example, research and development, if you have capitalized it or not, the classification is correct. So for assets and liabilities, I check revac. I need to check these as an auditor. These are the promises made by the manager. Then for p and L, what are the things that I need to check? For statement of profit and loss, I need to check O, that is occurrence. C, which is classification of expense or income. Excuse my spellings. And then you have to check the, uh, you have to check the cutoff that it is recorded in the correct accounting period. And then you have to check its completeness that you've recorded all the costs. Nothing is left. And then lastly, you have to check its accuracy again. And then presentation. Now, this is known as OCT cap. So, I need to check these things for the PL items, and I need to check as an auditor these things for my assets and liabilities. Now, to check these, to verify these, I need to do some work. So, what kind of work will I do on a PPE? So on a PPE, let's suppose to check its existence, I do physical inspection of equipment. So this is physical inspection is a work. I'm framing in procedure for one mark. Physical inspection of equipment. So what is the subject matter? It's the equipment. Why are you doing this? Why? This is not to be written. This this something which I've written in bracket is not to be written. It's for your explanation. So why are you doing this? Physical inspection of equipment to verify. It's now talk about the assertion. What are you checking by physical inspection? It's existence. Correct. So this is how you make an audit procedure. A top notch audit procedure which is complete gives you accurately one mark. Now, if you will not write this, you lose half mark. If you do not write this, you lose half mark. And forget about the professional marks. That is also what you will lose because you're going against the exam technique. You're showing lack of knowledge. You're doing silly mistakes. Right. So this is what procedure looks like. Now let's talk about the evidence. What would an evidence look like? Evidence is document so if i did physical inspection what would i have as a document with me as a proof now be the sherlock holmes okay so if you have done physical inspection what do you keep as an evidence with you maybe a photographic evidence you went to the place you took a picture of that equipment so that is what is your evidence so you of course need to keep that so what is my evidence photographic a copy of photographic evidence
two. Now, first you gave the document evidence of equipment. Now, if you write it till here, it is still complete. But still, if we want to make it more impressive, we can go and write about the assertion to verify the existence of equipment. That is same as procedures. That is same as procedure. So first I talked about the document. Then I talked about which thing, like the equipment is something which is the subject matter. And why? Because I want to check the assertion of existence. So this is how you write your basic uh, stuff related to procedures and evidence, which might be asked widely in question number one and question number two. Widely means widely, widespread, pervasive. It's like five marks here, six marks there, eight marks there, widespread in your paper. Procedures and evidence, very important for you, okay? Then lastly, in question number three, you can find something related to other assignments, which can be cash flow, which can be related to, uh, you know, it can be related to anything like forensic. And then you also get to something like review and reporting, which is critical appraisal of the audit report. You might get that. So all these things become really important in question number three. So you might even get your current issues here. So today I'm going to talk about the current issues also. There are basically uh, two things. One is big data. Another is sustainable uh, standard. Like, like in SBR, we have IFRS S1 and S2 now. Similarly, in AAA, we have a proposed auditing standard on sustainable reporting. So we are going to discuss that. So today I'm going to discuss a lot of direct theory questions. I'm going to discuss a lot of areas of syllabus. And I've given you the technique to write evidence and procedures. I'll also give you the technique of how to attempt business risk question, how to attempt ROMM question, uh, how to attempt review and reporting questions. So I will discuss the whole AAA syllabus fast track, okay? the important areas and we would also discuss about the exam technique so this is what we will see in this particular video so without any further ado let's get started so let's talk about the uh, first topic which is about professional skepticism guys so what is actually professional skepticism and why auditor uses this thing as a tool so professional skepticism is basically an attitude, okay? It's not some thing or so. It is an attitude of questioning mind. Refer to your notes from the description box. It's an attitude of keeping a questioning mind where you basically, uh, as an auditor, are always supposed to be skeptical, okay? That you, you should be alert that what is happening in this client's company, if th the things are going right, if the things are going wrong, uh, what might be the mistake, everything you have to consider and that is what skepticism actually is. So skepticism is an attitude of questioning mind and that is only possible if you are alert at all times. So why would a, you know, uh, auditor in or in which situations would the auditor keep this attitude in a situation where one evidence contradicts the another? In a situation when you have a prediction of fraud or you suspect a fraud. In a situation when you suspect a non-compliance with laws and regulations. In a situation where a judgment is used and you are thinking that maybe there's a risk of management bias. In a situation when the, you know, question is high risk when the uh, material matter is there and that is highly risky and there is a chance of uh, incorrect you know accounting treatment or material misstatement that's when you have to act like as a have a questioning mind and be alert to the situations around you as an auditor so this is something which the auditor uses as his weapon Okay, so it's the ingredient which goes into a good process of audit or a good quality audit. That is that the auditor at all times is skeptical. He tries to connect the dots. He tries to see whether there's a contradiction in one evidence compared to the other evidence. So that is hugely and very important that you are supposed to be skeptical. Okay, now next thing is audit committee. What is this audit committee doing here? So audit committee, you must have heard, is part of your corporate governance, isn't it? So what is audit committee? Audit committee is responsible for the, uh, you know, appointment of the external auditor. So it acts as a link 
between the external auditor and management or and shareholders. So it's like audit committee is the one who appoints the auditor, who took, uh, you know, talks to the auditor, who even has the right to remove the auditor. So audit committee is made for the external auditor only. And they, you know, uh, actually are made up of NADs. The audit committee is made up of NADs, which is non-executive director, because NADs are thought to be independent. Okay. So NADs are thought to be independent because they're not involved in the execution part. They're not involved, are actively involved in the business. So these people are really, really independent. That is why we keep NADs in our audit committee. And as an audit committee, this is their role that they have to appoint or remove the external auditor. They act as a bridge. And then they have to overlook the quality of audit. So anything when I say in the process of audit reported to TCWG, I'm talking about audit committee. I'm talking about people with governance, right? And if a company does not have a good audit committee or if they do not have any these in audit committee, uh, that is something which suggests poor corporate governance in that particular company, which can act as a business risk also and is a audit risk also because then there would be higher risk of MMS, material misstatement. Now, another thing is that out of these entities in audit committee, one person should always be there. One entity should always be there who has the experience in financials or you can say in financial reporting. So that person should be familiar with financial statements. That person should be familiar with plus and minuses, income and expenses, profit losses, everything. Then only you would say that you have a perfect audit committee with you. Okay. Next thing is ISQM1. Now in the process of audit, you all know what is the process of audit. It is the process of reviewing the financial statements and then you know giving your uh, opinion whether the financial statements are true and fair or not. Now in the whole process of external audit, you are supposed to maintain certain quality. Why are you supposed to maintain quality? Like why there is a need of quality check? We say it so many times that do quality management, do this, do that. But why in the world I need a quality check on audit? The first reason is that the audit is a very risky process because, you know, the financial statements are made on assumptions. A lot of assumptions are used in the financial statements. Secondly, they are also based upon judgments, professional judgment which is again a subjective matter and which is again something which can lead to management bias, right? So that is the reason why audit is something which is going to save the life of the shareholders. Shareholders do not trust the management. Shareholders know that, you know, there would be assumptions used, there would be judgment used. This is subjective. The financial statements might be incorrectly presented to us. So they do need an auditor at all times to check whether these people are lying or they are trying to manipulate us or not. So that is why we need to make sure that we have a good quality audit. Now, there are some systems of quality management. This is a system of quality management, which is set by ISQM1, which has eight processes or eight systems that you need to memorize. When I say RTM, retain to memory, okay? This is to be retained to your memory as it is. Check your notes. So there I've given you eight principles. First principle is firm's risk assessment process. So as an audit firm, you should have a proper risk assessment process where at all stages, whether it's an acceptance of a client or whatever it is, you actually to ensure good quality audit, you have certain procedures where you, you know, try to assess or identify the risk in a particular engagement, in a particular situation, what all risks can be there. So you just don't go with the flow. So uh, I should have, I should have, uh, if I talk about in a very recent situation, your grander vision was supposed to be YouTube live, but due to the mic issue, it went recorded. So now I should have maybe thought about this risk before. So that is where you say that I should have a risk assessment procedure. And that is an ongoing thing forever and ever. At all times, you should be keep on doing this. It's like an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process. Not that once at the planning stage, I assess the risk. No, 
at all times, 24-7, you're supposed to assess the risk. Now, that is what I mean by firm's risk assessment process. If it would have, the firm would have a good risk assessment process, there would be better quality of audit. Governance and leadership. Now, that's what very important. Now, I'll just tell you my experience. I, I'm recently, you know, I've started my own clothing brand and uh, I was busy with your classes and I have some few people working for us. Not a huge big deal, but already we have few people working with us for the worker stuff, manual labor stuff. And uh, when I was, you know, busy with my sessions and maybe I was ignoring my clothing brand a little because it was not yet launched. It's not yet launched. So you can check out our Instagram page though. But point is that at that point in time, it was getting a really uh, difficult thing for me to manage both of the things. For me, it was like I was divided between two things. But for my workers working at, you know, my clothing brand, it felt like they felt, okay, the owner is not uh, serious or the owner is not doing the stuff. So let us also relax. Now, what I want to tell you here is what you set as a tone of your business that really becomes a natural habit of your business. Now, that's what I learned the harder way. But then I amended myself. That's a different story. But... You are supposed to be responsible if you're in the governance, you know, role, if you're in the leadership role, you are supposed to set the culture of your environment of the business. So you are supposed to set the tone of the company. Now, as an auditor, if the, you know, engagement partner, if the people who are involved in the governance, they also have profit maximization motives. They also have like, okay, we keep Profit maximization over ethics. We keep, uh, you know, the whether we get more clients or not over quality of audit. If they have that mindset, that would obviously go to the other people working under the governance role as well. So under the leader, there would be a lot many other staff and they would have the same thing inculcated within them. That is why we say if you want to ensure a good quality audit in your audit firm, you should have such a culture which says ethics over everything. Good quality audit over everything. We do not care about profitability. We do not care about anything. What we care about is for, you know, the uh, public interest. We care about whether we give right audit report or not. So we are answerable to the public and that's why we prefer quality over anything. So if you will value quality, your staff will also value quality. That is what I mean by governance and leadership. And I gave you an example just for you to remember this point that what exactly this governance and leadership is because many students tend to forget this one. Next is relevant ethical requirements. What is relevant ethical requirements? You're always supposed to check whenever you are relying on work of anyone you know, whenever you are hiring someone, whenever you are working uh, with a component auditor, you're supposed to check whether those people have ethics or not. Now, you, you don't see whether they've attended moral science lecture or not. You just see, are they professionals? Are they under some code of ethics? Because if they are under code of ethics, they are supposed to follow it. Uh, you know, and if they don't follow it, they can be actually, you can file a complaint against them with the professional body. So that is why you have to make sure whatever you are uh, or whomsoever with whom you're working, they should have good ethics and you should also follow your ethics. Then acceptance and continuance of client. So when I talk about this, you all know what are our client acceptance procedures. So how can you accept a client? You can accept a client when you've done their KYC, when you've done their background check, that is know your client procedures, you know who the owner is. Uh, how they are making money and uh, what are their funds, like from where they raise the funds, you know, their investors, you know, the nature of business, if there's any politically exposed person within that or not. And then in the acceptance procedures, we talk about even uh, like you do the risk assessment of this company, they might be involved in money laundering, whether they, uh, they are ethical and you also as an auditor, by accepting them, will you face any kind of ethical threat? That maybe you're already providing them some audit service and now they're asking for some kind of non-assurance service. So can you provide those non-assurance services to them under uh, the code of ethics or not? That's what you look at. So before accepting a client or, you know, when you've done audit of one client, now next year, should you continue with the audit or not? 
again you have to see that okay whether i uh, my fee dependence is not increasing on this client so i need to recheck my independence there is no conflict of interest there are no issues whether client is mistreating us intimidating us by increasing the fees or decreasing the time of audit whatever the situation is you are supposed to check that whether you should accept the client and continue with the client or not as a part of your quality management because if you as a professional would not give quality as an auditor then of course the people would not rely on the process of audit itself the profession would be at stake so it's very important that we actually maintain the quality by having some risk assessment processes good culture and we set the tone from the governance and the leadership then we should have of course ethical requirements we should ourselves follow ethics and we should also accept the counterparty and we should only associate with people who actually follow ethics and then we should also accept and continue a client only once we have done our procedures then engagement performance now you must have seen a question in your aaa where they say assess the quality and this is a very famous question and this is like it will always be asked there is no paper of aaa where they have not asked you on quality of the audit so they will give a case study that in this uh, the engagement partner did come for the review or the audit partner or the audit manager has not reviewed the working papers or uh, the person who was an intern was sent to the uh, inventory count and he helped the warehouse manager to count the inventory or a person who is just a part qualified acca was given the work of uh, hedging the audit on hedging or the audit on share based payment now all these things are related to your performance as an auditor okay so like you give your paper you also have a performance now performance is divided in direction of audit like in which direction are you going which things do you think are risky so that is like the planning stage of the audit and then you have the supervision because at all times in the audit process you should have someone who is a leader or who is at a you know higher level seniority level to check your work so you should have a supervision with you and then lastly there should be consultation so if you feel that i am not an expert in this area for example in ifrs 2 uh, for example share appreciation rights and i feel that i am not good in this so i need to have someone on my team who is good in that so i need to take some audit experts opinion so if i am not doing this if any in the case study you know the question is asked always where there would be some quality issues maybe the engagement partner was not there in the planning meeting or there was no planning meeting conducted or you can say there was uh, you know someone who was incompetent was given the work of a higher level and maybe the working papers were not reviewed by the partner or reviewed by the manager or maybe someone was doing the work of the management like for example counting the inventory or maybe you omitted the risk like there was a control deficiency but you just ignored it you didn't perform the work on the opening balances all these are examples of poor quality of audit if you would find them in a case study what will be your way of answering that question first you will identify the quality issue then you would tell them that okay for example i'll take the example in turn was working was given the work of audit on financial instruments which he has first time seen now this guy is a part qualified acc now first you would identify that this is a quality issue okay that's your first thing second you will tell that why is it a quality issue now when you have to talk about why you first tell what is wrong with this intern why can't he work on financial instruments does he have some allergy no i'll tell them that this intern is first of all part qualified now this is coming from the question only so now if you write something from the question you don't get marks from it that is background now go a little step ahead of it now he is a part qualified acca which means he lacks the prerequisite knowledge training and experience okay and now because he lacks this kte and then you know talk about why financial instruments are difficult to handle so talk about ifrs 9 a little just tell them that financial instruments are kept under ifrs 9 which is an inherently risky area why is it inherently risky go a 
step forward it is inherently risky because it has a lot of complexities involved now because there are a lot of complexities involved and this is an inherently risky area and this guy is part qualified in lacks knowledge training and experience now again bridge the gap link them both if he would perform the work on ifrs 9 the risk is that there will be a lot of material misstatements which will go undetected which is basically a detection risk which showcases that the quality of audit was not up to the mark and there is a possibility that there are more such areas where the misstatements are undetected because there was poor allocation of human resource as per their knowledge training and experience so this is how you basically explain your quality management issues so you identify you tell them why and you tell them their effect like effect is there would be a risk of material mistake right same way if we were time pressured if the auditor was time pressured you would say audit is a lengthy process it is based upon a lot of judgments and assumptions which would lead to a identification of a lot of risky areas and work has to be substantive extensive where the auditor is supposed to collect evidences on each area now if he is put under a time limit pressure there would be a deterioration of quality of audit because of that time pressure where the auditor might cut the corners with some procedures so he might not do substantive procedures and therefore he might not be able to collect sufficient and appropriate audit evidence which will lead to bad quality of audit so this is basically how you explain your quality management problems i hope we all are clear on this right so this is uh, engagement performance now let's talk about the sixth point human resources so at all times in my audit form i should have appropriate level of uh you can say the auditors appropriate level of seniority of auditors to be allocated to the clients so if i do not have such staff available with me then of course i should avoid onboarding a client i should always check whether i have enough staff personnel and resources available with me or not then communication and information what kind of communication i'm talking about auditor communicates to tcwg in his report to those charged with governance auditor communicates with other parties like a uh, organization service organization from whom the client has actually uh, taken some outsourcing services auditor also communicates with outgoing auditor previous auditor so all these uh, which you know communications that you have informations that you get first of all keep record of it always and they should all be professional and uh, you know up to the mark then only you would be able to ensure your quality of audit then monitoring whatever you do to manage your quality or enhance your quality of work as an auditor make sure that you keep on ongoing monitoring on that so that okay i said that i would be managing my uh, diet and for that i set a diet for myself and then i say okay now i have i am following this diet but then after 10 days i forget to monitor my progress so that means i have to keep on ongoing monitoring so i need to keep on checking whether my uh, diet plan is on the right track or not so that is what ongoing monitoring is right so this is quality management isqm 1 next topic that i have is okay before i move on to the next topic you can read your notes and if you want you can read the accs technical article on isqm 1 okay that's very important and isqm 2 also you can just give a reading okay from the accs website even though the most important one is isqm 1 which i've already covered with you now comes no cla which is non compliance with laws and regulations so what are laws and regulation in whichever jurisdiction a company is working of course in that jurisdiction there are certain laws that you have to follow there are certain rules that you have to follow and if you do not follow them then you will be sued for example if i'm working in an industry where uh, let's suppose i have a swimming pool i have a club and there's a swimming pool now kids are playing in that swimming pool then there are some sort of regulations that i have to follow so that the small kids who are playing or who are learning swimming on their you know in their summer vacations they don't actually meet with some accident if i'm a offline coaching center i should have certain 
there are 500 people or students there in the coaching center, then I should have certain level of safety regulation, certain rule set, which comes from the municipal corporation, which comes from various uh, authorities that they tell us that you have to maintain these things in your coaching institute to make sure that there is no uh, fatality, there's no accident. So which is why I have to maintain some application of laws and regulations. As a client, as a company, like you're an auditor and your client would have certain laws and regulations to be met, which will be like, you know, from case to case. They have to comply with certain rules and regulations. Now, there is a risk that the client is not complying with these rules and regulations. Now, I'm not going to talk about those risks here. That's not my, uh, you can say, topic of discussion. What I'm here to discuss about is that if there is non-compliance of laws and regulations, who is responsible? Client is responsible or the auditor is responsible? See, compliance, if today you steal something and the rule in your land says that you're not supposed to steal anything, so who is responsible? The person who keeps an eye on you, that is the police, or is it you? Of course you. Police is not responsible. Police is there to catch you. And if they suspect on you, that's when they have to collect the evidence and again catch you. So who is having the primary responsibility of non-compliance? It's the client who has the primary responsibility of non-compliance. And he is the one who would be punished for it. But then what is the role of the auditor? Auditor has secondary responsibility. Now, auditor is working on this client. So auditor is supposed to see that if there is any uh, such laws and regulations which impact the financial statements, because auditor is all about financial statements. He's here to check whether the financial statements are true and fair or not. So when he's doing this check on financial statements, he's supposed to see that is there anything in the financial statements which impact or is there any laws and regulations which impact the financial statement? Because if I non-comply with this, maybe I've got some license and related to that license, there's a rule I have to follow. And if I don't follow that rule, maybe my license would be rebuked or maybe it would be, you know, I would no more be a going concern and that would ultimately impact the financial statements. So I have to see whether the laws and regulations directly impact my financial statements or do they indirectly impact my financial statements. Now, the ones which directly impact, okay, like I gave you the example of the license, the ones who which directly impact your financial statements, for that, the auditor is supposed to do some work on it. The auditor is supposed to collect sufficient and or, uh, appropriate audit evidence regarding their compliance. And if he identifies or if he suspects that there is a non-compliance like the auditor feels that yes there is a non-compliance if he identifies it or if he suspects this then he is supposed to collect sufficient and appropriate audit evidence about the nature of NOCLAR under which circumstances was this NOCLAR happening and what is its impact on financial statements and once he identifies and suspects the uh, NOCLAR he's supposed to report it to TCWG in case TCWG themselves are involved in a fraud or in a NOCLAR then you're supposed to report it to a third party like you can report it to the public now that might lead to some confidentiality problems that might lead to some uh, breach of confidentiality duty of confidentiality for that you might consider getting a legal advice so this is already there in your notes, in the description, right? So this is basically what I mean or what are the rules attached to NOCLAR. Now, if there is a NOCLAR, which is, or there's a laws and regulation, which indirectly impact the financial statements, for that, the auditor is just supposed to be skeptical or maybe inquire from the management and do some basic things that, okay, if I find something which is fishy, then I'll do some work on it. Otherwise, I do not have any active responsibility for anything which is not related to financial statements. So if they're doing child labor, okay, that indirectly impacts the financial statements. I would like, you know, if I get to know about this, of course, I need to talk about it to the authorities. But otherwise, I do not have an active responsibility of uh, identifying or preventing such no cloud. Okay. Now, after that, related to this topic is fraud. Just like no cloud, another very interesting topic is fraud. 
Now, in a client's company, there might be a fraudulent reporting done, which we also call as uh, window dressing, which we also call as earning management, earnings management. Yes. So there might be some frauds here and there. So in the client, if there are fraudulent reporting being done or there is misappropriation of assets, misappropriation of assets is basically, let's suppose I gave you a laptop to work at a firm, okay? So if I was running that firm and I gave you a laptop as my employee, now you're supposed to use this laptop for your own work, the office work. Now let's suppose you started using it for personal use. That is misappropriation of assets. Let's suppose I gave you some stationary material to use in the office, but then you took that stationary material to your home. Again, misappropriation of assets. That's like you stole the assets. So now what is the responsibility of the auditor? The auditor is supposed to find such risks of material misstatement, which might exist because of fraud. And for fraud also, the primary responsibility of the fraud lies with the client. Why so? Tell me, why so? You go and tell me because it's recorded. So you can comment now. Why do you think so? The reason is that if I talk about a fraudulent activity, that first of all, the perpetrator, it is very difficult for the auditor to be so perfect to even find the person who's done fraud. Because the perpetrator of fraud he is having such mindset that he wants to conceal what he has done. Read your notes. I've written it. Because he has a mindset to conceal what he has done. So he would do everything to conceal his wrongdoing. So auditor who is the preparator of uh, like who, who is supposed to find or identify the fraud. He won't be able to do it in all times in perfect. There might, there might not be a perfect situation, ideal situation where he'd be able to do this. Because the preparator of fraud has done a lot of things to conceal his wrongdoing. Now, similarly, another point is that whatever evidence you get for the fraud are persuasive. They are not, this is not conclusive. Please amend it in your notes. Write a note. It's not conclusive. So whatever evidences that I get with regards to my fraudulent activities, they are just telling me that this might be the case, this might be the case. But they are not telling me who exactly is the preparator and whether the fraud has really happened or not. So auditor might get an indication of fraud, but they, he will not get a conclusive evidence that yes, fraud has happened. Which is why for auditor, it's very difficult to identify or have a suspect on fraud. So he has a secondary responsibility for fraud and primary is again with the client. But if he, you know, he's supposed to uh, find all the risk of material misstatements due to fraud. And if he suspects a fraud or identifies a fraud, he's supposed to take action against it. And if he does not take it, then yes, there is an existence of auditor's liability. Right. So this is what we have from the topic of fraud. Now, when I say auditor should have a liability, is he, if, if he's unable to do all these things, then of course he would have a liability. Now that is known as professional liability, which is can be because of negligence, tort of negligence, okay? And it would lead to a civil liability. It's not a criminal liability. Don't think that the auditor would be put behind the bars. It's a civil liability. It's a civil case. The auditor was negligent. Now, if he was involved in a fraud and something, there might be a criminal liability also. When he actually became the preparator of fraud, maybe money laundering. Now, their criminal liability exists. But what is important for you is civil liability. Now, whenever the liability exists, you will only be, the auditor will only be liable if there was a duty of care. When are you liable for any wrongdoing? Were you responsible for it? If someone's kid is lost and they just come and shout at you, you're like, I was not responsible. He was your kid. You were supposed to find him. So that is when you say you have a duty of care. Now, think about an opposite situation. Let's suppose a kid was lost from a play or you, you talk about a school, a playway school. Okay. And now you would go to that principal and say, I send my kid for uh, studying in your school. So you were responsible for his security and the kid is lost. So in that case, the person had the duty of care. 
Now, similarly, the auditor must also have this duty of care before anyone sues him or tells him that you are responsible. Now, he must have breached that duty of care. So he must have done something due to which the duty of care was broken. Maybe he was negligent. Maybe he did it purposely, intentionally, fraud. And that should have led to a, you know, financial loss which can be quantified. So you should be able to quantify the loss which has happened because of this breach of duty of care. Just because there was a duty of care and the auditor has breached it. So maybe he was negligent in a sphere which was immaterial. So you can shout at him that you've done this. What's your loss? Quantify that loss. And once you've done the quantification, then you can talk about the auditor's liability. Right? So this is what we have in the auditor's liability topic. Now, you can get a direct theory question that how can the auditor limit his liability like how can he be uh, secured from getting sued like you've seen that many people in these days they don't want to be auditors because there are a lot of liabilities on him or lots of cases client does something auditor is in uh, you know limelight auditor is facing the issues so auditor has a lot of liability so he how can he limit it so while accepting only, he should accept such clients which are genuine, okay? So don't get someone who's politically exposed. No offense to people who are actually politically exposed. This is part of a syllabus, sorry. So you shouldn't get uh, acquainted with them. There might, because they're dealing with public money. So there is an issue with public money that it might, you you know, misutilize, which is why uh, we should accept such people whom we feel that, okay, they are safe to deal with. Uh, for example, you might not accept someone who does a lot of cash transactions, right? Uh, whereas you might accept someone who's doing an online business and they all have their money in their bank accounts and that is transparent and which is transparent even to the income tax authorities and even to the other authorities, right? So there's no scope of manipulation there. Then documentation. Once you've accepted a client, you thought that, okay, this client was good, but still it turned out to be a bad decision, which happens a lot many times in life and in auditors life as well so now what you should do is you should have a proper documentation i'm not talking about your whatsapp chats with your friends here and there i'm talking about formal documentation which is emails which is notes of the meeting you should have all those things with you and you should be able to keep them for enhanced period enhanced record keeping at least five years Keep them with you just in case sometime, you know, the ex-client comes back and say, hey, I have a trouble for you. Catch it. So you have a record to prove yourself right. Okay. Then you should give a disclaimer of liability as part of your auditor's report. So in your auditor's report, you can actually mention that, you know, uh, there was like, I just have this much liability as an auditor. This is what I'm responsible for. This audit report is only made for shareholders. It is only made for uh, bank authorities and government. So this is like you can give a disclaimer of liability that I'm not responsible. I'm just responsible for these, 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 these things. Okay. Then you can cap the financial loss. Now you can say, okay, if something happens because of my negligence in the auditor's report itself, we can say that I would only be responsible up to the 10% of the revenue, 10% of the profit of the client or 10% of the fee that I've received from this client. So you need to cap the financial loss. Do not keep it like, you know, anything like the court can say give all your assets to us because you are negligent and that's why the people's money has drowned so you are supposed to cap your financial loss another way of capping the financial loss is making your audit firm as a limited liability partnership you must know what is limited liability partnership or limited liability firm it's like as an owner you're just responsible uh, you are just, you know, a separate entity and the firm is a separate entity. And if there is a liability, the liability would be on the firm and not the person. Then lastly, in your engagement letter, you can even mention your auditor's responsibilities and make them sure that we will not be responsible for these things in future. So these are the ways by which you can limit the auditor's liability. Again, you need to retain it to your memory. It's a direct theory question. Right. So this is about limiting the liabilities. Now we would start with the part of ethics, which is very important for AAA. So ethic pay, plays a very important role in your paper where they directly ask you in AAA that what are the ethical issues in this particular case study and how would you be able to give a safeguard to that? So for that, you all have done it in AA as well, that what we have in ethics is PyCorp 
which is basically professional competence and due care, integrity, confidentiality, objectivity, and professional behavior. So at all times, as an auditor, you're supposed to follow PICOP, okay? You're supposed to be professional. You have to be competent. That means you have prerequisite knowledge uh, and enough experience to do the audit. Then you should be having your duty of confidentiality as well. That means I should not take or breach uh, the sensitive information or I should not leak the sensitive information of my client that I've acquired as a business relationship to others without their prior permission, okay? So I'm not talking about some uh, information like, okay, I'm working in that firm or I am on my notice period. No, these are not confidential issues. Confidential issues are something which are like of sensitive nature. So something which is of sensitive nature and you think is confidential is what you are not supposed to leak out to general public or third parties without prior permission. But you can leak it out under one situation when it is required in public interest. So you can leak out the information if you think that this is in public interest or is required by law. So you can, without the permission of your client, still leak out the information if you think it will help. Uh, it will help people uh, out there. For example, that person is involved in child labor and you want to inform it to the society because then uh, he's a criminal and you're supposed to report the criminal. And if you are asked by the court to come as an expert witness and give your uh, you know, witness in the court of law, then also you're supposed to breach your confidentiality duty. And that's okay. Then objectivity is like being, you know, unbiased, actually doing what uh, is like crystal clear in your conscious. Professional behavior, we all know. So in ethics, what we get as a question is that there are some issues or there is a situation that we would identify uh, which would lead to an ethical threat. And that threat needs to be explained. And uh, then we are supposed to tell them that why is it a threat and what are the safeguards? So what is the actual strategy of, uh, you know, answering an ethical question, the strategy, let's talk about it. So the first strategy is, to identify it correctly, identify the situation in the exam correctly. For example, the auditor was offered gifts and hospitality. Are you supposed to accept it or not? That's an ethical issue. Now, second is like which threat arises because of this issue? The gifts and hospitality would give rise to self-interest because if someone gives me something, I would become too favorable to them because my own interest is vested. My financial interest is vested in there. So I would talk about the threat and thirdly, I would talk about that why is it a threat? Why do you think is it a threat? Now, you're supposed to tell them, like, you just identified this is a self-interest threat. No. Why is it a threat? Because if I'm offered gifts and hospitality, I would have a financial interest. And that is why it's a threat. So, you are supposed to give this why and you have to take a step ahead. The whole paper of AAA, just like it was double A now. Now, they, they put one, they went a step ahead and put an A extra in this. So you are also also supposed to take a step ahead in this paper. So always, if you give something, go deeper into its analysis. And then lastly, you will tell them that what is the significance of the threat? Like if the threat is really high, so you're supposed to tell the significance. Like, for example, if the threat is faced by a partner, audit partner. So you'll say that is a senior level position. So it's a high risk key situation. It's a, it's a very important threat. And then uh, let's suppose the threat is about something which is, uh, you know, related to uh, some intern. Now, intern can accept gifts and hospitality still. It would be still okay because that is not of that much significance. Similarly, the significance also depends upon whether the company is listed or not. Okay, so listed or unlisted company, even that makes a difference while making sure that what is actually the significance of the threat. So you should be answering it in this way for the ethical issues. I'll just give you some important uh, situations of ethical issues. I'm not going to explain you the types of threats. It's there in your uh, notes again. So threats are self-interest. You have your familiarity threat, self-review threat, advocacy threat, management threat. That is when you get into the shoes of the management. So all these threats, intimidation threat. Now conflict of interest. What happens in conflict of interest? If I'm already auditing company A, and company B approaches me, who's the competitor of company A, and asks me to audit them. Now, there is a conflict of interest because they both are competitors and they are in the same industry. So as an auditor, 
I would actually inform both of them if I want to accept company B as my uh, client as well. So I'll tell company A that company B is also becoming my uh, client. And I'll tell company B that company A is already my client. And then with both of them, I would sign something which is known as confidentiality agreements. So that is basically that I'll tell them that I will not leak out your information from B to A or A to B. So I'll sign this confidentiality agreement with them. And then only I can accept this client. Otherwise, this will give rise to conflict of interest because what if you breach your duty of confidentiality and you actually leak the information to the competitor? Then gifts. So, uh, for example, if you receive gifts and hospitality from the client as an auditor, you're not supposed to accept. You're supposed to analyze that what is the nature, what is the value and what is the intent behind that gift? Are they gifting me something just because they want a favor out of me? Are they gifting me something which is trivial? Like, for example, if they gave me one notepad free of cost, I would say that is very trivial and I can still accept it. Uh, I, I just need to see what is their intention. But if they're gifting me a car or luxurious car, why would they do that? Maybe they want something which is like illegal or which is not good. And that's why they are gifting me uh, unnecessarily. So that is what I have to see. And I have to politely decline if the nature or value or intent of that thing is questionable, right? Then next is non-assurance services. What kind of non-assurance services can you provide to your audit client? So there are some non-assurance services like you have your advisory services, you have your taxation services, you have your, uh, you know, you can also design the uh, internal controls. Then you even have something like, uh, for example, you even have valuation services. So these are kinds of uh, non-assurance services which you can provide to your client. Now, someone is my audit client and he wants taxation services as well from me. So first of all, I would bifurcate between two, whether my client is listed or whether my client is unlisted. Now, if the client is unlisted, I can provide any services, even financial reporting services. Even I can do bookkeeping for him. Why applying safeguard? Safeguard includes separate teams. Like I should have separate teams and I should do quality control review. Okay. By applying the safeguards, I can give any kind of non-assurance services to my audit clients of unlisted company. Now, if they're listed, I can provide advisory services and rest. I cannot provide any services which affect the financial statements. Now, that can be computation of tax. I can pr provide tax filing services. That is administrative work, but not the calculation. Because if I calculate taxation for my audit client, at the end of the day, as an auditor, I would also review, you know, the tax figure in the P&L. So if I would have calculated it, it will create self-review threat. So I would not provide the taxation, tax calculation services, but I can at all times provide tax filing services, right? And then uh, I will not provide any financial reporting services, especially if you're talking about internal controls, which impact the financial statements. So you will see in your case studies that uh, you are requested by the client to provide such a service, uh, which is related to internal controls, which are relevant on the technology of reporting. So that is related to financial statement. So you can't provide that. That is disallowed, prohibited. So you have to keep that in mind. Anything related to financial statements for listed clients is prohibited. Rest you can provide. Why they are prohibited? Because they give rise to self-review threat. And if I talk about the internal control type of a non-assurance services, that also gives rise to management threat at some times. Why management threat? Because uh, you might assume the duties of the management. You might feel that design, implementation, and control of, uh, you know, design, implementation, and maintenance, DIM, of the internal control is my responsibility, which is actually not. It is the responsibility of the client. So you are not supposed to do all those stuff. Okay. So that is why we uh, accept certain non-assurance services. That is why we sometimes reject non-assurance services. Fee dependence, if you already have an audit client and you're dependent on him, for example, if from one client you're getting around 15% of your fees, okay, uh, total fees that you receive as an auditor, 15% is coming from one client or 15% and more for two consecutive years. 
then we say you are over dependent on that client. Reduce your fee or maybe reduce the services that you're providing to that client because then it is becoming too, it's like he's a major client and you don't want to offend a major client because you are dependent on that client since you're getting 15% or more uh, from that client only, right? So that is why uh, it creates a self-interest threat. This creates self-interest threat. Then contingent fee, what is contingent fee? It's strictly prohibited, okay, whether listed, unlisted, whatever. It is strictly prohibited. Uh, under the code of ethics, you can't base your audit fee on the basis of the performance or on the basis of how many other services are you providing or what will be the profit of a client. We can't. Because in that way, you're saying that the audit is not dependent on the scope of work. Rather, it is dependent on the, uh, you know, like other stuff. So that is not acceptable and that is strictly prohibited. Okay. So that being said about the ethics, we have a topic of money laundering. You would just read it from the notes. So in the money laundering, it is a process, just a quick debrief. It's a process of converting the black money, illicit money into white money. That's a basic definition of money laundering. You try to conceal who is the owner of those funds or who is the criminal here. And uh, what you do in here is you do the placement the process is placement first you place that illicit money in your legal money for example if you are having cash receipts if you have cash sales so whatever cash you have from black money you would actually place it along with your legitimate funds second is your uh, layering now layering is basically when you keep on uh, moving that uh, particular cash like there is a lot of movement of cash for example from one bank to another bank, from one country to another country. So all those things are classified under layering. So I keep on buying and selling stuff just to, you know, have the circulation of funds. So in the process of circulation, what is happening? That initial placement is getting concealed. Then third is integration. That is when you finally integrate. This is the final step of money laundering. When you finally integrate it, the black money into the legitimate environment. For example, uh, you had some black money, you sent it abroad, and then from there you sent it somewhere else. Then you purchased something, sold something, you kept on regulating or sorry, circulating that money. And lastly, what you did, you bought some jewelry out of it and you said, okay, this was something which I got from my ancestors. Now that is integration. Now there are some indicators of money laundering in the case study. If you see any company who's having a lot of cash sales, now, that is an indicator of money laundering. Any person who is politically exposed, no offense again, indication of money laundering in the case study for our exam perspective. Uh, then any uh, such thing where you are making a lot of transfers here and there, where you're making uh, the money transfer from bank to bank, bogus bank accounts, or from country to country. For example, especially in the tax heaven countries, like, for example, uh, you know, you, you know the countries where you can actually have that money being sent, Cayman Island and all those areas, Bangkok. So that's where uh, the fund transfer is very easy and you can actually, uh, you know, use those countries as a tax haven and for uh, illicit fund. Now that being said, what are the rules or what are the procedures which ACC has adopted for anti-money laundering? First is KYC. Okay, ACC says that please do your know your client procedures before you accept them. That's quite obvious so that you don't accept someone who's involved in money laundering. Because if you accept someone who's involved in money laundering, you might indirectly become part of the crime uh, because may, you may tip off. What is tipping off? Tipping off means that someone was stealing something. Instead of calling the police, I tell them that I know you've stolen it. And now that person knows that I know his truth. He might harm me or he might try to destroy the evidence. So that is why we say that tipping off in itself is a crime. Then after the KYC, it's quite important that, uh, you know, you should train your employees. And uh, what you should train them about, you should train them about money, laundering, reporting officer mlro mlro is a nominated person first of all and he is a person who is of a senior level okay he's of a senior position and what he is responsible for actually is he is responsible for whatever happens in the company he's responsible for uh the you know uh money laundering related stuff okay so he's supposed to uh you can say 
take the reports like suspicions of the reports and prepare a report on money laundering uh, suspect that who do you think is the suspect of this activity so if in a company anyone suspects there's a money laundering happening they would report it to him he would prepare a report to be reported to the enforcement agency right so we need to go uh, and take it to the enforcement agency and that's what mlro does then you need to train your employees that report to mlro you need to have a good uh, communication within the uh, company within the entity and you should do enhanced record keeping so that sometime if you're stuck in such a situation as i said earlier also you're supposed to keep the records for at least five years so that you can use them as an evidence in the court of law so these are the stuff which acca says with regards to money lottery okay now that being said we are being uh, done with ethics we are done with uh, some important points like matters to be considered evidence procedures stuff like that now comes the question of business risk which might be asked in question number 1 what is business risk business risk is all about like how a company might get impacted because of certain things so if i talk about business risk uh, for example in the case study it's given that uh, you took a loan took a significant loan now what does that suggest now when you take a loan it increases your gearing so your way of answering should be that you first identify the situation and you tell them what is its impact. Its first impact is taking a loan increases my gearing. It makes my company risky. That's one thing. Second thing, with loan comes the financial risk. What is the financial risk? The risk is that I might not be able to repay my loan or I might not be able to repay my contractual payments of interest, which might lead to liquidation. Now I can even link this that okay if i've taken a loan do i have enough funds to repay my loan for that i can calculate my interest cover ratio yes i can calculate my interest cover ratio and tell them whether i have the capability of repaying my loan i can look at my liquidity all my liquidity ratios okay and after looking at my liquidity and solvency ratios i can just inculcate them in my business risk point and lastly conclude that there is a risk that due to which I won't be able to repay my money, which will lead to, uh, you can say, I would no more be a going concern as a business. So I would have to seize my business. Now, that is how you explain a business risk. It's a two marker. For every business risk question, you get two marks. Every business risk point, you get two marks, right? So you identify the situation. Then you tell them that why it is a business risk, what are the negative impacts it might have. And then you uh, even relate it to certain ratios and certain figures given in the question. Okay. Now next is review part of your uh, syllabus. So I've told you the way you have to answer business risk questions. But let us now talk about the question number three that we get. I said usually it has review and reporting. So in review and reporting, what we have first in the review stage of audit is events after subsequent period. What is subsequent period or events after reporting period, not subsequent period. So in here, this is the time scale. This is the reporting date of a client. After the reporting date, audit happens, right? Once the audit has happened, uh, you know, you, you would actually sign the audit report. After that, you would actually issue the audit report so this is the date of issue of audit report okay so reporting date and audit report authorization date now once there is any event so you have done the audit of this period previous year if anything happens in this time frame okay if anything happens within this time frame between the reporting date until the audit report is signed this is the signing date when you have signed the audit report. Between these two dates, the auditor has an active responsibility to have a look at what all is happening at the client's company. Anything which is adjusting event as per IS-10. You know what is IS-10? For that, if you don't know what my grant revisions on SBR, they are regularly updated each attempt. So for IS-10, I would say if there would any adjusting event, auditor has an active responsibility to identify that. Now, uh, if the period has passed and from audit report has been signed and now it is 
issued as well. So between the time of signing and issue, here the auditor has a passive responsibility. What is passive responsibility? That means auditor will not actively be involved in finding or doing procedures on some things. Auditor would sit quietly. The management might, you know, uh, bring something to their notice and then the auditor will have to perform some work on it. That is passive responsibility. If anything happens within this time frame after the issue of audit report, then auditor has no active or passive responsibility. If anything comes to the notice of auditor by chance, then he might actually get into the further discussion with the client's management and try to uh, say that should I reissue my auditor report or not. So that is something where, again, he doesn't have any responsibility. He might do it. He might not do it. If he got to know about something, then only he would take any action. Right? So this is for the review stage of audit. Then it's about going concern of the client. So you all must know that uh, there are a few things. There are two things, in fact, not few things. One is uncertainty regarding going concern. Another is that your assumption was wrong. Your assumption of going concern was wrong, incorrect. So one is uncertainty of a going concern. Another is assumption was totally wrong. Now, if a company has uncertainty regarding going concern, you're just supposed to disclose it. You're just supposed to disclose it. I'm telling you the accounting treatment. Okay, I'm not telling you the auditor's treatment. I'm telling the accounting treatment. So you're just supposed to disclose the uncertainty. But if you are no more a going concern, you are supposed to prepare your financial statements on alternate basis. We also call it as breakup value basis. Yes. Now, once you have done that, of course, you will do a disclosure as well that uh, the financial statements are prepared on NRV basis. Otherwise, how would the stakeholders get to? Them? They won't know what figures you've used. You're supposed to disclose on the face of the financial statements that these are based on NRVs because we are no more going concerned. This is a very important point. Now, if the client has reported all these things correctly, if we are no more going concerned and the client has made their financial statements on the alternate basis and disclosed it correctly, then for this disclosure, I will inculcate an emphasis on matter paragraph plus I would give an unmodified opinion. Unmodified opinion. Why I would give an unmodified opinion? Because there is no material misstatement. There is no misstatement. EOMP emphasis on matter paragraph is a positive paragraph where I'm just emphasizing the disclosure note for the users of the auditor report. So the client has already emphasized on it in their financial statements. As an auditor, I am also further emphasizing through my auditor's report towards this disclosure. I need to mention the note number that uh, please refer to this note number. This is just brought to your notice, even though it is correctly disclosed, but this is an important note. Just like when I'm talking to you, I say, look this in your notes, this is important. So I'm putting an emphasis. That is emphasis of matter paragraph in the auditor's report, right? Now for uncertainty, see, you've correctly disclosed it, good. If it is correctly disclosed, you will put it in MURGC paragraph. Now, again, if it is correct, then also you are adding MURGC paragraph. So, even if it is correct, I'm still adding MURGC paragraph. Where again, as an auditor, I'm just putting emphasis on uncertainties. So, this all thing happens when the accounting treatment is correct. So, if the accounting treatment is correct, MURGC paragraph plus unmodified audit opinion for uncertainties and for I'm talking about audit opinion not report because if you add in your RGC paragraph the audit report will be modified why I'll explain you later when I talk about audit report but uh, if the accounting treatment is correct as per this IS1 standard that I've explained you then MURGC paragraph for uncertainty and uh, then it is the unmodified opinion, then for no uh, incorrect assumption, EOMP plus unmodified opinion. Now, if it is incorrect, if the accounting treatment is incorrect, then what I'll do? I will give your qualified opinion. And I will explain that in my basis for opinion paragraph that why I've given a qualified opinion that this is 
like uncertainties are not disclosed properly. Then if the assumption is wrong, this is a very material misstatement. So I will give an adverse opinion where I'll say this is a pervasive misstatement because this disclosure is fundamental to users' understanding. And if you have not prepared it on alternate basis, then the whole financial statements are incorrect. So it's a pervasive misstatement. And then I would also, uh, you know, in addition to adverse opinion, I would also give modified report. So this is what I would do. There would be no em emphasis or you just leave this one. There would be no emphasis on matter paragraph. It would be just an adverse opinion with basis for adverse opinion. So this is all in all what you are going to do for your going concern review. Crux of this going concern thing. Okay. Next. Now comes the reporting part of your audit, which is again very important. So let's do this. So in the audit report part, you need to remember the name of your friend. If you have watched my previous lecture, you know his name. It's Tau Kora Re. So let's forget about the read. This is a, you know, standard, uh, you can say content of audit report, which is like copied and pasted from internet. So I'm not just going to explain you that. And what is Tau? Tau is title of the audit report. Who is the addressee? Uh, what is your audit opinion? Then what is your basis for opinion, right? And then you have your CAM paragraph. Then you have your other information paragraph. Then you have the responsibilities of the, uh, you can say, management and the auditor both, right? So that is what you state in your audit report. Again, these things are very, uh, you can say, standardized, like date and who who is the addresser, what is the liability, all those things. So let's just erase this one. And now this is your, uh, you can say, basic format of audit report. This is the sequence of your contents. Now, if the sequence will be wrong, you will critically appraise it and say that this, the, uh, this is unprofessional audit report because the sequence is incorrect. Now, let me make you understand what kind of opinion do you give in what situations. If your misstatement is just material, but not pervasive, not pervasive. Pervasive is that it is widespread. Read it in your notes. I've given you the definition of pervasive. Something which is widespread in the financial statements or is a very significant amount of the net assets of the, uh, you know, revenue or of the profit. That is something which is known as pervasive. So if it is material, not pervasive, in that case, you give a qualified audit opinion. But if it is material as well as pervasive, if it is material and pervasive and pervasive, then you give adverse audit opinion. So that is like the worst kind of an audit opinion. Now, if it is uh, material and you do not have enough information available, no information for the collection of uh, sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. So maybe there is no record available. The record was uh, burnt in the fire. So in that case, we give disclaimer of opinion. So in any case, when there is no sufficient audit evidence available, then we give disclaimer of opinion. And in basis for opinion paragraph, we explain why there is a particular opinion given. Now, if I change, for example, if my opinion is unmodified, then I would keep the name of my friend same. Now, if the opinions, uh, let's suppose, is becoming adverse. So the name of the opinion paragraph will change to adverse opinion. So now it would start from A. Then basis for opinion will be termed as the heading will be basis for adverse opinion. Again, the name of our friend will change. So whenever the name of the friend changes, name of Taubukora changes, that is when you say that the report is modified. Remember this concept? There's a difference between audit opinion being modified and audit report being modified. So when the name of your friend changes, your report is modified. Okay. Next thing, what I have is for the Quora part, Taub Quora. So in this, what do we mean by K? K stands for CAM paragraph. What is CAM paragraph? CAM is key audit matters. So what you communicate to TCWG 
what you communicate to tcwg let me teach you that you communicate to tcwg anything which is like uh, you know uh, for example auditor's responsibility what was the scope and timing of the uh, audit that you've conducted so this is what you communicate as an auditor to the those charged with governance and then you also tell them about significant findings from the audit like you can talk about high risk situations uh, you can even tell what happened during the audit maybe the information was not available or was made available was not made available on time or somebody uh, you know they they came into the process of audit against you so all those things which happened during the audit which you feel are the significant findings of the audit is what you would actually uh, report to tcwg or you would communicate to tcwg now these significant findings which you think are highly risky and highly material you can even make them a part of your cam paragraph so key audit matters you tell them what is cam like which issue is cam why do you think it is cam and how auditor dealt with it so if you said that there was a significant judgment regarding some valuation or assumption regarding some valuation it's a cam because it's a very material uh, value but it was based upon some judgment which is subjective that is why we consider it as a key audit matter but then how did you deal with it as a uh, auditor right that's what the question is so that is what you explain in cam paragraph then in other information paragraph uh, you just tell them that if there was a ceo statement so you just explain that here now if there is a misstatement in ceo say statement with the reality so ceo said we have 200 employees but in actual you just have 20 employees so in that case there is an inconsistency so i will move this paragraph from here to here from after cam to after basis for opinion now when i do this even if my opinion is unmodified, even if these two headings are not changed, still the name of the friend will change to Taub. This will be the name of friend because this O will go from here to here. So when the name of the friend changes, audit report is modified. Similarly, there might be certain situations where MURGC, material uncertainty regarding going concern is added. Right? So where, where do you add this MURGC paragraph? You add this MURGC paragraph here. Then I said there is a paragraph on emphasis of matter. Now that is added after CAM. EOMP or OMP are the matter paragraph. These are the two paragraphs. EOMP is where you emphasize or draw the user's attention to something which is important. For example, in uh, when the, there was a correct disclosure regarding financial statements prepared on the basis of NRV basis. So you just emphasized in the audit report. So that is which is placed after CAM. What is other matter paragraph? For example, there's another matter that you want to report. For example, previous year's financial statements were not audited. So that is another matter which is not related to financial statements or which is not related to any number or so. So that is uh, reported in the audit report. So if the opinion is unmodified, everything is fine, but MURGC was added, emphasis of matter paragraph was added. So name of the friend would change. It would now become two tau and MURGC is M Kiora. So now the name again changes. So even if the opinion paragraph has not changed, due to the addition of positive paragraphs which are added without any misstatement, in MURGC, you're just again. It's a positive paragraph. Emphasis of matter paragraph. It's a positive paragraph. Uh, other opinion, uh, other information, if it is here, then also it's a positive paragraph. But if it comes here, it is due to an inconsistency, which becomes negative. And uh, then what we have is all these are positive paragraphs. So even if this happens, the name of the friend is changing. So the report is modified. So this is what is there in the reporting part. If you didn't understood it, uh, didn't understand it in the first uh, go, like it's a fast track thing. If you're doing it for the first time, if you are revising, you would understand it. If not, then please go and watch. I would put play paste the link in the description box. I've already made a video on audit report in detail uh, a few years ago, so you can watch. It's still relevant. Okay, so report being done. What I have next is my reliance small topics can i rely on component auditor when i'm doing group audit 
yes i need i can rely first i need to check what is the materiality that means is that component material to me so in a group audit if you have a subsidiary do you need to see that you know is it material subsidiary so how can you figure that out you need to apply the 15% rule that uh, 15 if the revenue from that subsidiary is 15% or more than the total revenue then we say that okay this is a significant component or it can be significant by nature as well then i would see if it is significant i can do full audit on that subsidiary as a group auditor or i can do some specific audit procedure on certain account balances and disclosures but if it is not significant then i can place reliance on component auditor now, before I place reliance, I need to see his competence, whether he follows code of ethics, whether he is independent. That means he can work independently. He's not facing any ethical threats who are compromising or making him compromise his integrity and objectivity and how good internal controls he have in his form. Once I have assured that, then I can, of course, rely on component auditor. Can I rely on the work of service organization? Same thing. I need to check their knowledge, training and experience uh, to, you know, I will check their ethics as well. I will check their internal controls as well. Now to check these, I can get a type 1 or type 2 report. What is type 1? In type 1, you just see that uh, the service organization, you can uh, get to know their design and their, you can say the implementation of internal control like uh, how they are designed and implemented. You can just get a report on that. In this type 2 report, it's not just design and implementation, but also it's operating effectiveness. So if you do that, that is basically your type 2 report. That's how you place reliance on service organization. So all in all, lastly, I'll talk about the other assignments. When you are accepting anything you know when you're accepting uh, any engagement whether it's forensic cash flow audit forensic engagement that where you are becoming a fraud investigator you can see in detail in your uh, pdf and uh, then you have cash flow cash flow is when you're supposed to uh, review the cash flow forecast so in review stage you just simply perform procedures like uh, you you would perform procedures on the forecast you will do analysis so you will analyze stuff, you will review things, you will inquire from the management. So you don't actually go into the field and do physical inspection, recalculation, stuff like that. You just analyze, inquire, review, okay? So that's what is a desk job. Then in audit, how do you accept a client? So for forensic investigation, it's important that you understand that before acceptance, I need to see whether I would act as an expert witness. What is forensic investigation? It is like an other assignment apart from audit where I am recruited to find the fraud in the company. There was a reported fraud. I need to find who is the preparator of fraud. I need to quantify the loss. So I need to see whether there was actually a fraud or not. So all these things, before I accept such an engagement, I need to first see, will I be used as an expert witness in this case? If yes, I need to, you know, rethink on this. Should I or do I need to actually work on this uh, client or not? Because what if I get uh, indulged in some issue because of them? I don't want to go to court of law. So maybe you need to check that expert witness thing. Then what is the risk profile of the case? Of course, is the client risky? Maybe they are criminals themselves and they are putting the blame on someone else. So if it is risky, then you would avoid it. Uh, do you have the competence to perform this? What would be the fees and the basis of the fees? Do you have the resources to do this? All these things and ethics, of course, you have to consider before accepting any engagement. Same remains for the other engagements as well, including audit. Okay. Then what I have is my current issues. Okay. So for my current issues case, I have two current issues, big data and one is on sustainability. So let us first talk about big data. What is big data? Whatever you surf today on Google is getting stored somewhere. So it's it's like whatever you Google, whatever I'm speaking today, uh, tomorrow if I, I remember yesterday I said, okay, I'm craving for a pizza and then suddenly a message pops up from uh, the, if you're an Indian, you would understand Zomato. And they start crying, we're missing you and all those, order this, order that. So that is something which is a, like whatever you say, speak, technology is hearing you. Whatever you search, 
they are hearing you. So that is getting stored somewhere in a cloud software, which is big data. Now, this is an unstructured data, which businesses do actually use uh, this unstructured data by using certain tools. They would structure it and use it for marketing. Yes. So that's what they do with big data. And they also use it for analysis. So now what are the, uh, you can say, auditor's perspective here? Auditor can also use this big data to his advantage. But this also has a disadvantage. So you should know the positives of big data, negatives of the big data. Positives is you can use it for marketing, for analysis, for better understanding of the risky areas of the company. Uh, you would get to know a lot of things with big data. You would learn a lot. But the negatives would be that there is a risk of uh, leakage of data. There's a risk of manipulation of data. There's a risk of uh, breach of confidentiality if you have data of your client. So that is one thing which is very easy. I'm like, okay, you know this already. So this is nothing that you should go and read as a technical article. But then what is important is ISA 5000, which is a uh, proposed uh, ISSA which is uh, International Standards on Sustainable uh, Reporting on Auditing. So let me just show you that. This is the standard uh, on ISA 5000, which is actually proposed right now. It is not currently there, but it is proposed standard on International Standard on Sustainable Assurance. What is here? Let's check it out. Okay. Fine, let's go. So here what I have is general requirements of sustainable assurance engagements. So increasingly shareholders, especially institutional investors are demanding more information. So I would just brief you this. You can read it on your own or just rely on my brief and the notes which are given to you. So what is there is we first talk about that why sustainability is important. You all know what is sustainable reporting? from uh, your SBR. I hope you all know this. It was a very important part of your syllabus where you actually report all the kinds of capitals and you give qualitative disclosures. Now in SBR, if you've already passed it, we have a change where we now have a proper standard on sustainable reporting as IFRS S1 and S2, which I recently explained in a video of my YouTube, the recent uploaded video. So this is like sustainable reporting and the importance of it. Now, if people are doing sustainable reporting, uh, clients are doing sustainable reporting. So auditor also needs to check whether the uh, sustainable reports are true and fair or not. So like financial statements are true and fair or not is a question. Similarly, whether the sustainable reports are true and fair or not is a question in itself. So for that, what we've done is we have proposed a standard under the standards on auditing that should we do this? Because there are many people who are using this assurance as a commercial opportunity. Like they are giving this sustainable report just to increase their trust, just to increase their reputation. But actually they are not doing what they are saying. So as an auditor, it, it becomes really important for you to check what, what, what they are saying in the sustainable report is correct or not, true or not. So which is why we need a standard on sustainable reporting auditing as well from the auditor's perspective. Okay, so now let's see what's here. The proposed standard key principles. So proposed ISA general requirements for sustainable assurance engagements was issued by the International Auditing Board on August 2023. Okay, it's a very recent thing. That's why it's important. Uh, so there are two princi uh, key principles to highlight. First of all, it is applied under multiple framework. So what is multiple framework? There are many different reporting frameworks uh, which organizations may be required. So many multiple reporting frameworks which may be required to choose or comply with. The reporting framework such as GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, Integrated Reporting, uh, the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures, the ISSB which has issued IFRS S1 and IFRS S2. So there are local regulations also. So to all these things, this proposed ISA will apply. So it's not that, it's like you're saying this ISA does not just apply to IFRSs, but it also gets applied to various other rules, which includes IFRSs, UK GAAP, local regulations, GRI, integrated reporting, et cetera, et cetera. 
So it's an all rounder standard which is proposed and it is used by non accountancy professional. So the second point to notice that ISA is a profession agnostic. This means that it can be used by any assurance practitioner. So it can be a lawyer, a doctor, anyone. So it's not just to be used by auditors. It can be used by anyone who's providing assurance on sustainable report, maybe an environmentalist. So they should adhere to relevant ethical requirements. The people who are acting as an assurance provider here, they should apply a system of quality management, which is at least rigorous as those used by accounting practitioners. So they can only use these uh you know proposed standard the professionals can use it if they are having ethics they're meeting some ethical requirements like doctors they do have some code of ethics environmentalists i hope they would have or they have signed such a thing uh second thing is they should have such a quality management system in place okay then this means that non-accountancy professionals can use for example experts in environmental matters or scientists so what is sustainability? We all know what is sustainability, uh, where we talk about climate, energy, emissions. We talk about consumption of uh, non-renewable resources. We talk about biodiversity. We talk about labor, et cetera, et cetera, all those outskirt things of the concept. So it's all about environment or society. Now, when we apply it, our objective is under ISA 5000, we are talking from the perspective of the auditor. So our objective is that we need to obtain reasonable assurance, first of all, that whatever information is available in the sustainable report is free from MMS. There's no material misstatement in the uh, sustainable report. And second is to express a conclusion on the sustainability information through a written report that conveys a reasonable assurance or a limited uh, assurance conclusion as applicable and describes the basis of the conclusion. So first of all, you need to find misstatements in that sustainable report. Second of all, you need to give your opinion. Lastly, to communicate as required by this ISA and any other relevant ISA. So first objective under ISA is to find or uh, material misstatement in the sustainable report. Second is to give a, you can say, conclusion or an, uh, you can say, your opinion. Thirdly, you are supposed to communicate that opinion via a report. Right. Just like we have ISAs for reporting on audit. Similarly, we should have ISAs on reporting on sustainable reports. Then uh, what they're saying is that ISA 5000, which illustrates different form of assurance reports, can be provided distinguishing between those reports which include limited and reasonable assurance in line with other types of assurance engagement. Higher level of assurance that is to be provided, more robust evidence is required to support the conclusion. So they're saying that in audit, it's sure that you're supposed to give reasonable assurance. But in this case of sustainable report, you might actually give uh, limited assurance. So we should have different formats for limited and reasonable assurance on sustainable reports. And if you're giving reasonable assurance, you should have a higher level of uh, evidences and work being done, which is quite obvious, right? So this is what they're saying in here. And then how to accept the engagement? You should accept the engagement if you understand the client, if you know or have an experience in this. Uh, you know, if, if you uh, have the resources to do this, all these things should be considered. You can make your own answer. It's same. Ethics should be considered. Knowledge, training, experience, resources, fees, basis of fees. And especially in this case, uh, your expertise matters. That Do you have an expertise or experience in such an area or not? Okay. Then what we have is planning the engagement. While planning the engagement, here we use double materiality. What is double materiality? See, I've written it in your notes. What is double materiality? Materiality is a significant issue and it needs to be applied in a bifurcated approach. First, considering materiality for qualitative disclosures and determining materiality for quantitative disclosures. So I should have different materiality for different disclosures, one for qualitative, another for quantitative. And then materiality for a reasonable assurance engagement is the same as limited assurance engagement because materiality is based on information. So they're saying that we have same materiality for any kind of report that we are giving, whether reasonable assurance or limited assurance. But we have to apply the concept of double materiality. What is this double materiality? Very important to note. 
consideration of the significance of the impact of a sustainability matter on the organization. So first of all, what you've reported in your sustainable report, how is it important or material to the organization? Secondly, how is it material or how is it important to the society? Okay, so one is how is it important to the organization and second, how is it important to the outside world is what matters to you, which is double materiality. Again, it's a stupid concept, but given a big name, double materiality. Okay, that's what you have to consider in the planning stage of the audit. And as usual, you have to, uh, you know, identify the risks, then you have to collect the evidence. Okay, so then you have to report and now, what is there in the report? Here they've given us greenwashing. What is greenwashing? What people usually do now, they actually want to show that they're really good in the environmental fields, like they're really good in environment in society and people in general. So what they do actually is they overstate the facts that they're doing. So they say we donate this, we donate that, but actually they're not donating. So that is something that I say is greenwashing. Like you are making your own image, building your reputation uh, by falsifying or giving false claims. So what is the risk in sustainable reporting is that the person who's making this sustainable report is greenwashing. That's number one risk, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's a fraudulent reporting. You are frauding the consumers by saying that I'm doing this, but you're actually not doing it, right? And there is a higher risk of error also because this is a deliberate misstatement. And also all these areas of sustainable report, they do not have any factual information or they do not have any quantity. When you say that uh, I have generated or my you know staff is uh, giving me five stars, they, they love the environment we have. That is not a fact. That is something which is based on judgment. It's again a risky area. You're just claiming something and that is highly subjective. So this, this is not accounting treatment. This is not like audit where we have IFRS 9 to be followed. And if it is wrong, we say it's material misstatement. This is something based on judgment. This is something which is uh, very, uh, you can say, fishy and messy. So that's why we say that, okay, this is a risky thing. Then you will also find difficulties on obtaining evidence over qualitative disclosures. Because they are future-oriented information that we would do this to our company. In five years, we'll be there. In 10 years, we'll be there. This is how we will impact the society. All these things are claims, future-oriented. You will not find su sufficient evidence for it, right? So all these risks of greenwashing, there is a need to apply skepticism and to document how this has been applied as part of obtaining evidence, which backs up the assurance conclusion. So given this whole thing of greenwashing, which is happening, it's very difficult for the auditor to give a reasonable uh, assurance that everything is correct. So maybe he should opt for limited assurance and accordingly draw a conclusion out of the things. And maybe he can obtain a written representation as well. Now, if I talk about the ethics in this case, uh, what, what can be the ethical situations in this uh, sustainable reporting? See, the same things applies, integrity, objectivity, competence, confidentiality. The most obvious threat which relates to assurance would be competence, okay? So do you have the competence to deal with sustainable reports? Like, you're accountants, right? You're not environmentalists. So how would you get to know? You are not scientists. You are not environmentalists. So you might not have the competence. And this IFRS S1 and S2 are recently introduced stuff. You might not have the uh, competence in that, knowledge of that and training of that, right? So it, it might become like you do not have the necessary knowledge on this and uh, you know, knowledge can be developed but a deeper level of understanding cannot be delivered overnight. So today I'm delivering you the knowledge on sustainable reporting but I've also not worked in this area, okay? I might have worked in the financial statement segment but I've never worked on the environmental segment of uh, how they report and uh, what is correct and what is not correct. So I cannot develop it overnight. Maybe I need to work with few clients and then understand this thing and then finally, okay, say that this is happening. So which is why it's becoming very important these days uh, that, you know, ethics are applied. You should have the competence before you accept anything. Then there might be a self-interest also. You do not have the competence just because that client is your audit client and you'll get more fee. You would accept the client Anyway, just because you want to have more fee, new line of work, lucrative new line of work. 
there might be also a self review threat why because if you're doing external audit of financial statements and working on sustainability information in case assurance provider make sure that the separate teams are used because there are some aspects of sustainable reports which are related to financial statements also if you would check and review both of them this will create self review threat so what all ethical issues would be there? Competence would be there, self-interest would be there, and self-review would be there. How to accept a client? It's same for sustainable uh, assurance engagement. And uh, double materiality is the concept where how it is material to the organization and how it is material to the uh, outside world. That's what you consider. And uh, what are the problems you will face with sustainable reporting uh, assurance provision is that it is difficult to obtain evidence. Uh, people are greenwashing and you actually might not have uh, that evidence with you because of, you know, it being a very subjective area or an assumption based area. So all these things I've given you a brief of your uh, ISA 5000. I would request you if you could read it yourself from the SSA website if you want to. Otherwise, what I've given you as a brief, if you can, if you have that uh, power in you, you can actually make an answer out of it yourself. Most probably, they would ask you acceptance, ethics, or they would ask you that what are the troubles or the uh, limitations for which an auditor faces in case of sustainable reporting. And I really predict this question coming up. And the audit on ESG factors, so just read those technical articles. And I would just paste the link in the description box of those technical articles just in case you don't know how to uh, reach them. So that's it, guys, for this uh, grand revision. And lastly, all I would say is that please give your best shot in your exam. Okay, keep smiling and give your best shot in the exam. Whatever the situation is, be ready to face bouncer questions. Whatever comes up, you need to anyway give the paper, right? So whenever a thought strikes your mind that I might fail this, there is a possibility I'm not getting to know this, uh, I, I would flunk. Just remove those thoughts because anyway, you're supposed to write this paper. So give your best fight in the paper and use your common sense. Use professional words, keep your exam technique top notch and give your best shot and fight that paper as much as you can and then re, you know leave rest up to the court. So that's it, guys. I hope it was a helpful revision. See you in the next video, maybe uh, for another paper next attempt. So that's it. Thank you for watching it till here. Bye-bye. See you in the next one.